the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, firstly, I just wish to thank uh, Abdul Latif and uh, his team for welcoming me here to, to Malaysia. Um, I've not been here that many times. I've just spent a little bit of time in uh, Penang, and uh, where we ran a trade benchmarking workshop, which some NPC staff attended. And so it's been really useful for me to uh, learn more about some of the Malaysian organizations and uh, some of the challenges they're facing and hopefully I'll hear more from you this morning about some of the challenges you're facing and then we can really discuss and share how benchmarking and business excellence can really help you to meet those challenges and improve your organizations. My first presentation this morning is going to be more about business excellence. I'm not going to follow this agenda strictly. So it's going to be more about business excellence first of all because that sets the scene. It's a sort of the wider topic, and then we're going to really focus on benchmarking and how benchmarking can help your organizations to improve. But first of all, I just want you to understand what benchmarking and business excellence is before I then focus on, on, on business excellence. And to do that, I'm going to ask you how good you are at identifying particular animals, first of all. I think it's a good way to start the morning. So. I want to test your knowledge of wildlife and see whether you can identify what bird this is. Ostrich, yes. And an ostrich is well known for burying its head in the sand. So when an ostrich is, is frightened by a predator, like a lion, the story goes that an ostrich will bury its head in the sand. And this is, in fact, the way many businesses react. They bury their heads in the sand. What I mean by that is that they're not open to new ideas. They do the same thing year on, year after year. What we want to organizations to be more like is an eagle. Exploring new frontiers looking over the next mountaintop, seeing what other organizations are doing which have been successful and learning from their successes. So we don't want you to be restricted to your own organization. We don't want you to do, do the same things year after year after year. If there's another organization that's been successful, you want to find out why and learn about other organizations' best practices and see how you can adapt and implement them in, in, inside your own organization. And this is about not just exploring what happens in terms of other Malaysian organizations. I mean, that's, that's, that's key because they're closer to you. And there's an awful lot of best practices here. But you also want to look outside and explore internationally what's happening too. And I think too many organizations are inwardly looking. They need to be more outwardly focused. If you also think of an eagle, an eagle's got fantastic vision. It can spot a rabbit on the ground from a distance of almost two kilometers away. So it can spot what's important for it to survive. Through benchmarking, you can identify what's important for you to do inside your organization. Because benchmarking enables you to compare your performance against other organizations. And where you're weakest, or where there's a big opportunity for improvement, you can then think about how you can address that opportunity for improvement through learning from the best practices of other organizations. So we want more organizations to be like eagles rather than ostriches. If we look at the history of benchmarking, we now go back to the 1980s. And rank Xerox were the pioneers of the benchmarking approach. In the early 1980s, rank Xerox were in danger of going out of business. They'd seen their market share drop from 86% of the world market share to just down, down to 
due to the competition from, uh, uh, from, 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 from coming out from Korea and Japan. So they were in danger of going out of business in the early 1980s. And they recruited a new senior management team. And that senior, new senior management team had to consider whether to downsize and restructure or whether they could think a way of revitalizing that organization. And what they did at that time in the early 1980s was quite unique. They did two things. One thing they said is that we know we can't compete. We, it, it costs us as much to uh, manufacture the pro our products as our competitors are selling them at. So we just can't compete with our competitors. We know that. We know the quality of our products are not as good as our competitors. So what they said is that we need to improve everything we do inside our organization. And we need to learn from the best. But when we're learning from the best, we want to learn from the best from any industry that they come from. So we want to find the best leadership system. It doesn't matter what, what industry that, that, that leadership system is, what, what industry that leadership system is from, we're going to learn from organizations which have the best leadership system, the best governance system. We want to learn from organizations which have a great way of delighting their customers. We want to learn from organizations which have a great way of managing their supply chain. So they looked outside their industry for best practices, which was quite a revelation at the time. They learned from Honda for supplier development. They learned from, from American Express for the financial control systems. They learned from Ford for factory layout. They learned from Toyota for the quality management systems. So they looked outside the industry for best practices. The other thing that they did, which was quite unique at the time, they used a very systematic approach to learning a 10-step methodology for learning from other organizations. And that approach became known as benchmarking. So there's this, this, this two things, looking outside the industry and also using a very systematic approach to learning. They undertook over 200 benchmarking projects and transformed their organization within eight years to become a world-class organization. How do we know they became world-class? Well, we know because they were the first winners of the Malcolm Baldrige Award in the United States, which recognizes world-class organizations. They were also the first winner of the European Foundation for Quality Management Excellence Award in Europe. So they're acknowledged as world class. And for those of you who are familiar with business excellence and have applied for award, you know you have to describe a lot of it. You need to provide a lot of information about how your organization operates, the systems and the performance you're achieving. And that needs to be assessed. And depending on the, the model you're using, you need to write down, a, you need to record in a 50 page or 75 page document, say everything that you do. And so when Rank Xerox applied to win the American Award and the European Award, European Award, they shared how they achieved their success. And obviously they described this 10 step methodology. And so other organizations start to learn, started to learn about the benchmarking approach because they described it in, in, this, in, in their reports when they applied to win these major awards. So since the late 1980s when they won the Baldrige Award and then in, in Europe in 1992 when they won the European Award, more and more organizations started to learn about the benchmarking approach, primarily through Rank Xerox experience. This, for those of you who are unfamiliar with business excellence, which I think, I believe that most of you are, this is a Malaysian business excellence framework based on the Baldrige model. So this is what Rank Xerox were assessed against in 1988 when they won the award. 
We'll have a look at this in more detail later on. But the situation today is that benchmarking is the most popular tool and technique in the world. So I think organizations recognize they're, up, they're operating in a global business environment and they need to be continually learning from the best. They need to be continually improving their practices. And benchmarking enables organizations to capture those best practices and bring them back to their own organization. So this morning I'm going to be talking about business excellence and benchmarking. But I'm going to be starting off with business excellence because this is providing the bigger picture. Then we're going to focus down on benchmarking. First of all, provide a bit more background about my organization and myself. Uh, I'm originally from the UK. I've been living in New Zealand for about 13 years because I've done my own benchmarking and I believe New Zealand, apart from Malaysia, is the best country to live in. So this is where I live in, in New Zealand. That's my house. New Zealand's got lots of land, very, very small population. It's only got about 4 million people. But what we have got, we've got over 20 million cows <laughs> and over 50 million sheep. It's just, our sh it's just a shame that our government is not represented equally by each animal species. Then we'll make better decisions. There we are, that's my home. <laughs> Unfortunately, I spend six months of the year traveling, so I'm not there as often as I'd like. I have three jobs in New Zealand. I work 20% of my time for Massey University, where I supervise uh, PhD students. Now, this is one PhD student who's recently completed his doctorate, uh, Muslim Hamid from Malaysia, and he's now assisting MPC. And uh, he was looking at uh, how different organizations had won the, the, the National Business Excellence Award and seeing whether some common themes can be learned from these organizations that, that had become award winners. And now he's developed this sort of uh, tool set which now can now assist organizations on the journey to excellence. And I believe he's working with MPC to uh, test it out in organizations in Malaysia. We also have a Canadian student who's looking at the triggers of business excellence. Therefore, why should organizations start along this journey? And what gets them to start along this journey? Is it because they're going through a crisis point? Is it because of government in intervention? Or is it because they've got a really forward-thinking CEO? Because if we know the triggers, we can encourage more organizations to follow this path. I have another student from Singapore who's doing a PhD on informal benchmarking. Uh, there's two types of benchmarking, informal and formal. And most of us do informal benchmarking all the time, whether we realize it or not. We're always comparing experiences and knowledge. And hopefully you're going to learn from me some best practices today. And that's, where, that's a type of informal learning, informal benchmarking. So he's doing a PhD looking at how organizations can do informal benchmarking more effectively. And my other role is uh, I'm the f founder of BPR.com Limited. It's a website with lots of benchmarks and best practices. And because I've been so lucky to be invited here today, then I'm also pleased to say that we can give you one month's free access to this website resource. So we'll need to, I think, get your email, access, email addresses for that, and I think we need somehow need to share that with uh, MPC staff to make that happen. So you'll have a chance to look at that resource and learn from some uh, Malaysian best practices, which is got in there, but also international best practices. And thirdly, I run a consultancy organization called Coa Limited, where we provide uh, uh, consultancy, benchmarking, and business excellence. And in particular, we promote the trade best practice benchmarking methodology. And this is what I was giving training on in Penang over the last couple of days. OK, so to start off, just to make sure everybody's at the same level of understanding, we're going to quickly go through what is business excellence. And then we're going to share with you the latest research in this whole area so you know what's happening from a global perspective. 
So it's not hard to know what business excellence is. I mean, every organization wants to achieve fantastic results. That's, you know, we want to, have, we want to achieve fantastic financial results. But also, every organization has a number of different stakeholders. To be a stakeholder means you have an interest in the success of the organization. So our employees are stakeholders, our customers are stakeholders. So we want fantastic results in terms of all our stakeholders. We want to make sure that you know, we support the local community and we don't pollute the, the, the environment. So all of these are stakeholders. So we want fantastic results for uh, our shareholders, for our customers, for employees, for the local community, and for the community in general. So I don't think any organization would argue against that. The way that we achieve that is by making sure we've got some great leadership practices in place where we empower our people to be leaders too, so we just don't have one leader inside the organization. We want to have excellent planning inside our organization as well, so we know what we're striving to achieve. So we have a vision, mission, plans, goals, and they're clearly communicated. We want to be able to share information inside our organization on our, our performance. We want to share our knowledge inside the organization. And of course, we need excellent processes. So these processes will be aligned to your, your strategic plan and ensuring that your customers are going to be happy and delighted with your products and services. An essential aspect of any organization is, is people. We need happy people. Happy people make good products and services. And will stay with your organization. So you're not having to recruit people year after year. And of course, every business needs customers, otherwise you don't have a business. And this is about not striving, this is about not only meeting their customer needs, but ideally delighting the customers. So they come back again and again and again. So it's quite simple business excellence. That's what business excellence is. It's about having good management systems in place to address those areas, and then obviously we want to achieve fantastic results. And these frameworks assess how well you're doing in each of those areas. The models, this is a model. Yeah, it's, it's an assessment model. That's what it is. It's an assessment model. It assesses where you are on a journey to excellence. And actually scores you out of a thousand points. And based on that, you can see where you are. The main purpose of these models is to really just help you to know where you are and to know where you're weakest where the opportunities for improvement are, to help you know whether you've got to focus more on your leadership system or your HR system. This is, why you're, this is how organizations use these models as an improvement uh, tool. So business excellence models assess where you are. And then benchmarking helps you to improve through learning and applying better practices. So if you think your organization is quite, quite weak in terms of your HR practices, then it means you've got to do some benchmarking. You've got to learn some, from some other organizations which have better human resource practices and find out what they're doing differently. Perhaps another organization has got a better recognition and reward system. Maybe their employees are more, more empowered. So you want to learn from these other organizations how they've achieved that. The so business excellence models assess where you are in terms of world-class performance. Benchmarking helps you to improve through learning from the better practices of other organizations. And I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding in terms of benchmarking. People think that benchmarking is just about comparing data. Comparing data does not help your organization to improve one bit. You can look at comparisons between organizations as long as you want. It's not going to help your organization to improve. You can stare at these graphs. It's not going to help your organization to improve. What helps you to improve is learning from the better practices of other organizations. So benchmarking is not only about comparison, it's also learning from the organizations which, is, which are achieving higher performance levels. That's why it's called benchmarking, I-N-G, at the end. 
If you're just doing a comparison, it's benchmark. If you're doing the benchmarking with the ING, it means you're learning from the better practices of other organizations. Let's have a look at the history of the uh, business excellence. It differs, I believe. I'm not sure about the history in, in Malaysia, but in general, between the a Asia and West, it, it, it differs uh, quite a bit. In the West, there's a real focus on total quality management. And the actual first use of the word total quality management was in 1984. That's the first written paper which actually used the words total quality management. And then we have the application of total quality management using those words by the Naval Air uh, Systems in 1985, the Baldrige Award in 1988, uh, the FQM Award in 1992. At the time they were introduced, they were called TQM models, Total Quality Management Models. They weren't called excellence models, they were called Total Quality Management Models. And for the first time, they were describing what Total Quality Management was. And then, there's a change in wording because a lot of organizations before 1988 and 1992, they were confused as to what total quality management was. You'd have different consultants saying TQM was this, another consultant saying TQM was something else. And so there had been sort of a backlash against the word total quality management because there's a misunderstanding about it. So the models helped to clarify that understanding but still, you had some organizations, because of the history of it, still being a little bit confused. And so, the bodies that were, the organizations that were responsible for the total quality management models decided to rebrand them and call them business excellence models. So it's a rebranding exercise, just to make them popular. But they are, in fact, TQM models. So you see a lot of um, quality associations and uh, Quality foundations in Europe also change their names from quality associations to business excellence associations or business excellence foundations. It's just a rebranding exercise. ISO 9000 is more designed, designed around now uh, business excellence. There's also a Global Excellence Model Council now, which ensures that these models around the world um, are, are compared against each other and. Uh, uh, also are meeting the global challenges of organizations around the world. So that's the history from the West. Now we have over 80 countries around the world using these business excellence models. In Asia, what I've tended to found is a lot of organizations still using the vocabulary total quality management. You very, very rarely hear the vocabulary total quality management in the West. In Asia, Total quality management never had, uh, I, I guess, the same level of misunderstanding that happened in, 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 uh, in, in, in Europe or in the West. So total quality management never got a bad name in Asia. So total quality management continued as usual through all the tools and techniques. At the same time in Asia, through the mid, late 1980s, early 1990s, a lot of Asian countries heard about business excellence, and sometimes they thought that, we, that business excellence was different than total quality management. So in some cases, you have people talking about TQM in Asia and also business excellence, thinking they're different things, but from a Western, Western's point of view, it's the same thing. And we can see here the various years the different countries have introduced business excellence. I believe that Malaysia introduced business excellence in 1998, but they've really revitalized their programs of business excellence from about the year 2009. So all I'm saying here is when you're talking about TQM and business excellence, just have a conversation with, with that person and, and try to understand where they're coming from. But business excellence is essentially the same as total quality management. It's just a way of um, clearly, more clearly, I think, articulating what TQM is because it's, it's a consistent model. It's a model that can be described. Well, TQM, people will have different interpretations of what it is. The, I guess that the building blocks of business excellence are shown in the core values and concepts. 
and they're very similar between any of the major business excellence models. So these are the building blocks of excellence that the, 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 the actual models themselves are based upon. So in fact, if, you, if you're asking me to describe what is business excellence, this is business excellence, the core values and concepts, because these are what you need to embed inside your organization. The models that we saw are assessment tools. So the models are used to assess, but these are what, they actually, what actually business excellence is based upon. And this is what a lot of research has been done upon, to show that if an organization embeds these core values and concepts inside their organization, the organization is more likely to be successful. And you can see the similarities between the different models. So when your organization is striving for business excellence, you should be thinking about how you can embed those core values and concepts inside your organization. Half the countries in the world now have a business excellence award. So an award is, is there to recognize organizations which have shown outstanding performance. Pakistan is the latest Asian country to launch a business excellence award. And now we're listing here all the various countries across Asia which have a business excellence award. What we need to know though, and I think what's important, is that business excellence is much more than an award. This is what I'm trying to get across. Business excellence is about embedding those core values and concepts into your organization. So to be successful from a national perspective, you need to have a national business excellence strategy that increases awareness of what business excellence is and helps organizations along that journey. And if a country is going to develop a national business excellence strategy, it needs to decide on two things. Firstly, which model it's going to use. And this has to decide whether it wants to design its own model or use one of the, 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 the already, a model that's already been proven. In Malaysia's case, you decide to use a Baldrige model because there's lots of evidence that shows that this model is applicable uh, to, to organizations anywhere around the world. It's, it's not just applicable to organizations in the West, it's applicable to organizations throughout the whole of Asia. It's it in fact used by most Asian countries. The second thing a country needs to consider is how to deploy that model. Therefore, how to get organizations about excited about using that model. And when you're talking about deploying a model from a national perspective, firstly, you've got to create awareness of the framework. You've got to people, let people know what it is. You then need to provide assistance to help organizations improve after they've had an assessment against the model. So that might be through training on different tools and techniques, providing events where organizations can share their best practices, maybe providing a, a database of information that organizations can use. And thirdly, they should be recognizing outstanding organizations to encourage other organizations to follow that path. And the whole reason a country is doing this is to improve the management practices and performance of organizations. To have a big impact on the competitiveness of a country. A study by Lincoln Scott in the United States showed that um, investment by the US government of $1 into the actual business excellence produced a benefit of $207. A more recent study by them, and this is publicly available as well, and it really goes into detail in terms of the methodology they use, shows that $1 invested produces an outcome of $800 for society in general. Even if the benefits were not as much as that, and you were questioning the, 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 the actual, their actual research approach, even if it was a quarter of that or a fifth of that, it still shows how important it is to support business excellence and encourage organizations along this path. One of the problems that has happened, though, internationally is, is that there's been a misunderstanding of business excellence. And I think a lot of countries haven't had haven't really thought through 
how to deploy a business excellence strategy across the whole country. So a lot of countries spend too much time debating the model itself and it's the relevance of the model and the validity of the model. And a lot of countries spend too much time on the recognition process, on the award process. And yet, to get most organizations involved in business excellence, surely you've got to spend most time creating awareness and providing simple tools and techniques to get them familiar with the model, to use the model. But most countries spend too much time on this. And also, because to recognize these outstanding organizations, they've got to go through a very rigorous process. It takes a lot of time and effort. Not any time and effort of the organizations that are trying to win the award, it takes a lot of time and effort to organize by the administrative body. And often, you know, from a country's perspective, they might say, yeah, we want to promote business excellence. They set up an administrative body. Maybe they have 5, 10, 15 people working in that administrative body. But they quickly find out to run an award, they need virtually all their team focused on running the award. And there's nobody left over to really create awareness of what business excellence is and provide assistance on business improvement. And this is like, uh, it, it happens in my country, New Zealand, too much time is spent on the award process rather than providing simple mechanisms to help organizations improve. So this is just showing the award process in New Zealand, which would be very similar to, to, to Malaysia. You've got to train evaluators, you've got to promote the award. There's a lot of work that needs to be undertaken. Okay, let's have a look at the difference between awards and self-assessment. Awards offer recognition. Self-assessment, you, you can do a self-assessment yourself against these frameworks using a very simple questionnaire or having a consensus meeting, debating how your organization performs against these models. So awards generally used for recognition. Self-assessment is used for improvement. Awards are for the few. Only a few organizations in a country can win an award. Self-assessment can be for everybody. Awards require rigorous assessment. Self-assessment requires a simple assessment. Award scores are important. Self-assessment strengths and opportunities for improvement. Strengths and opportunities are what generate actions. Knowing your point score is not necessarily going to generate an action. Knowing what you're strong and weak in will generate an action. But both are aligned to the business excellence model. So we really need to get more organizations using self-assessment tools and methods to evaluate the business year on year. Actually, I've looked at uh, Malaysia's roadmap for business excellence, and uh, it does look extremely sensible. I don't know exactly how I'm going to find out uh, this afternoon more details about this. It's a, it's, it's a very sensible approach, and I think this is why they've revitalized the approach in 2009 along the lines that I'm talking about. Therefore, trying to create greater awareness and model providing uh, more simple tools for organizations to assess themselves. So it's saying here that they measure how an, organization, how an organization performs in terms of business excellence. There's then some sort of intervention process to help organizations to improve. There's also a certification process where you can become uh, um, Malaysia's Malaysia Productivity Innovation Class Organization, if you score over a certain number of points, and then you can go on to win an award. So in Malaysia, they've really started to address this, which is, which is a good sign. OK, a couple of years ago, I did a study for the Asian Productivity Organization, looking at the value and impact of business excellence in Asia. This was on behalf of India, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, and Thailand. Unfortunately, it didn't cover Malaysia. And this was the most comprehensive study that's been undertaken. Uh, we spoke to a lot of CEOs. We held discussion groups uh, across all of those countries where we had senior managers from organizations that were using business excellence frameworks to uh, describe uh, some of the challenges that they face using these frameworks and some of the benefits they've obtained from using these frameworks. And we also conducted a, a survey of all award winners across these regions. So it's very thorough um, research methodology was used. 
The actual findings from this research are available for free here. There's a report. Uh, you'll be able to have a copy of these slides later on. We'll provide a copy of the slides in PDF format, so you can have a look at the slides later on. Okay, I'll just go through some of the six key findings from this uh, research. Um, I'm glad to say we found out that business excellence does indeed have a major impact on competitiveness and performance. I won't go into all the graphs and all the details, but this is just to say that those organizations which were pursuing a business excellence approach outperformed those which weren't. And this is actually showing in red those organizations which were more mature in business excellence and showing their point scores against um, these business excellence frameworks in comparison to those which were less mature. So they're outperforming other organizations across all types of results. Not only financial results, but also the more qualitative types of results an organization may be looking at. And all this information is shown in detail in the report itself. It also showed they were outperforming the other organizations in terms of their management <coughs> systems. They had better management systems in place. There's a lot of other studies being done. And they're not directly related to business excellence, but business excellence is all about improving your management practices and systems. And a lot of research that, that, that shows that if you follow this path, you're going to reap the rewards, you're going to benefit. And even a small improvement in management practices is associated with the same increase in output. There's 25% increase in labor force or a 65% increase in invested capital. For most organizations, they can increase, they can in increase their performance by just focusing more on the talent already inside the organization and getting their people to work more, more effectively. And this is just a basic example of this. This is another study by the Asian Productivity Organization. And this was in Pakistan in the textile industry. And they found, again, that people development and training was found to be the most effective and lowest cost strategy for learning and applying innovative practices. And it was better than uh, buying new technology. It's more about training people. Which you often find there's a lot of bad practices in organizations. And this is some of the bad practices in the textile industry in Pakistan. I mean, obviously, these are bad practices. Everybody can see the bad practices. The amount of re rework that's just lying on the floor, poor housekeeping, compliance issues, safety issues. And then with better training, those issues can be addressed. And this helps to improve productivity. And so you'll find often through doing a simple self-assessment. I've never known an organization not do a self-assessment and not find it of benefit. Usually a self-assessment will find straight away some problems can be quick, that can be quickly addressed, which don't cost a lot of money to address. So I encourage you to use these frameworks. Uh, the next finding was that whilst awards are important, their prime purpose should be for recognition and encouragement are not seen as the end of the journey. It's important that organizations see business excellence not as an award, but as an approach that helps them to continuously monitor, manage, manage, and improve performance. When we ask this question across Asia, though, when we ask them what's the purpose of business excellence, what is business excellence, we found that over 60% disagreed with this uh, though, almost over 30% agreed with this statement. 30% 30, 30 of organizations thought the prime purpose of the business excellence framework is to assess a company's management system performance so that an award can be given to the best company. So over 30% of the businesses thought these frameworks are just used for awards, which is ridiculous. It's only a small part of what, an award is, of what a framework is about. A framework is there to help an organization to improve. So we need to change that. Okay, number three. 
Business excellence frameworks are relevant for long-term competitiveness and, flex and sustainability, and only minor changes to the design of these frameworks is required. You know, people always question these frameworks. You know, saying, is it relevant you know, for a Malaysian organization? You know, it's, it's, it's always the case. But we tried to answer this by asking uh, to, to, to the, these groups of uh, senior managers across Asia, we, we first of all asked them this question. We said, what are the main current and emerging challenges facing companies in your country? Bear in mind, this was taken a couple of years ago. And this is some of the answers, and they vary depending on the country we were looking at. So in Japan, they were saying that meeting the requirements of multiple standards adds to our cost base. In many cases, these standards should be integrated or reduced. So that's one of the major challenges businesses are facing in Japan. They're also facing a change in demographics, an older population in Japan. Singapore, at the time, we were asking them to say the world financial crisis was impacting on them. And also, they're very concerned about cultural and social integration and harmony between race and nationalities. Of course, wanted a mobile workforce, and they also had the challenges of an aging population. India, it's more basic needs, basic challenges, diseases, swine flu, epidemics, fraud, money laundering, corruption. Thailand, cost of energy was a concern, lack of skilled workers. And Taiwan is obviously the relationship with China, <coughs> and also environmental issues. So these are the major challenges organizations are facing in these countries. We then asked them whether or not business excellence helps them to meet the challenges. And the answers that I show you now, the responses from these senior managers are not what I've written. These are in the words of the, the teams that uh, participated in these discussion groups. So the road to these answers on the flip chart, and I'll share some of them with you now. In fact, we just probably have a look at the, the, the Singapore response, which is the one in the middle. They said that business excellence helps companies to address macro challenges at the micro level. Therefore, category two, strategic planning helps to address the financial crisis. Category four, people helps to address cultural and social issues. Category five, processes helps to address legal requirements and international standards. And category 1.3, leadership and social responsibility helps to address environmental issues. So what they're saying is if one organization uses the framework, it's going to help them at the micro level. But if you have lots of organizations using the framework, it's going to address the macro challenges facing the country. They're sensible frameworks. And I think Singapore's done very well. They very, very rarely make changes to their framework. They just keep it the same, very simple, year on year. OK, the next key finding. Focus on implementing the core values and concepts of business excellence. And remember, the frameworks just, just assess where you are on your journey. Uh, this slide here is sharing many of the internal issues hindering the commitment to implement business excellence. And again, are related to a lack of understanding of what business excellence is. So a lot of organizations were saying that the reason why business excellence is not taken up more inside their country is because of a lack of understanding of business excellence, a lack of understanding of how to develop a business excellence culture, and also the benefits from business excellence are not clear to them. And so, we need to emphasize now more. We need to promote more the importance of these core values and concepts and describe how they can be embedded inside your organization. So it's these core values and concepts that are important. So I think the training that's provided by MPC and other similar types of organizations around the world should be more focused on these core values and concepts and help organizations to embed them. This, is, this, this slide here provides some ideas on how to embed the core values and concepts into your organization. It's difficult to see, so I'm going to uh, try and read this out. Um, it's, it's showing, in red, it's showing the, the, the actual methods used by, diff, by, high, by, by organizations which are very mature in terms of business excellence. And it's also showing the tools or methods used by organizations which are very low in terms of business excellence. So blue, blue is those organizations which are immature. Red is those organizations which are quite mature. And it shows that organizations which are more mature in terms of business excellence do different things than those which are less mature. So in particular, 
organisations which are very mature in terms of business excellence are more likely to be educating and training the majority of staff on business excellence. Organisations which are more mature in business excellence are more likely to have senior management who fully embrace the ideals of business excellence and understand it. Organisations which are more mature undertake a business excellence self-assessment every year and have internal self-assessments. They just don't rely on another organisation coming in to do a self -assess uh, an assessment of them. They've also they've developed their own internal assessment approach. But at the same time, they do have external assessments. Usually what they do is have an internal assessment every year and maybe every two or three years have an external assessment. So this is, it. this is saying here, this one here, saying we assess our business, business excellence performance every year. Over 60% of the more mature organizations do that. They also have category leaders. So it means they have somebody inside their organization who is responsible for improving performance with respect to each of the business excellence categories. So therefore, after an assessment, they're responsible for making sure that actions are implemented and followed through. They have category leaders. Does your organization have category leaders? We also have improvement teams, obviously focus on improving performance in, in those categories. They also, they also implement improvement actions based on their assessments. And senior managers are fully involved in the assessment process. So if you want to embed the core values and concepts, you've got some of the answers of how to do it right there. So there are different assessment tools that can be provided, and I think MPC provides a number of tools and provide assistance in this area. So there's um, very quick approaches that can be used, like a questionnaire to workshop approaches, where you're getting people together to have consensus opinion on how an organization performs with regards to a particular question. Or you can go to the more comprehensive approach, which is like an award approach. But you don't want to go for an award if you're just starting the journey. You really want to start off around here. And the reason why you do an assessment is to identify your areas of improvement and strengths. You can therefore define and prioritize your improvement activities, develop action plans, and monitor progress, and celebrate success. And you do that on an annual basis. It's not hard, it's not difficult, and it can be fun. Okay. The other thing that I, I, I hopefully you've already got a picture of this is that business excellence frameworks are an overarching framework. They're like an umbrella. Business excellence doesn't compete with Six Sigma or Lean. It doesn't compete with any balanced scorecard. It doesn't compete. But business excellence is the overarching umbrella to assess the excellence of your organization. Within that, there are many different tools and techniques you can improve to, perform, to improve performance. So these are examples of different tools and techniques to improve, to improve leadership performance, like succession planning, planning managing, management by walking around, different tools and techniques you can use for strategic planning, different tools, tools and techniques you can use for customer focus, so on and so forth. So business access is the umbrella. So you need to make sure you've got tools and techniques that you're using to improve performance. When we studied these organizations across Asia, we tried to find out, is there a different set of tools and techniques used by very mature organizations in comparison to those organizations that are less mature? We had significant, statistically significant results for these uh, tools and techniques shown in yellow. So organizations which are more mature in terms of business excellence are more likely to have a corporate social responsibility program. They're more likely to use SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis. I would have thought every organization should be using SWOT analysis. So I'm not sure if that's a statistical anom anomaly or not. But I'm surprised about that one. But interestingly, other tools and techniques are lean, improvement teams, benchmarking, and knowledge management. So again, emphasizing the importance of benchmarking. You've got to do benchmarking if you really want to become a world-class organization. I really like this statement by Jamie Ambrosi, Deputy Director of the Boardage Program. He says, I think where organizations get off track is when they think Boardridge is just an initiative. 
rather than a model for organizing and managing the enterprise and all its, and all its initiatives. If Baldrige is reduced to an initiative rather than an overall model and a way of thinking, then organizations can say they have done it and move on. We see this all the time. But in organizations that embrace the Baldrige framework as an overarching model, they never move beyond it. This includes very high-performing organizations, including our award recipients. So business excellence is not an initiative. It's not a one-off. It's something that becomes ingrained inside the organization. I found this, I mean, I visited all these organizations across Asia, and they were using these models in different ways. These models are really helpful. So these are diff this, this is how different organizations across Asia were using the model and finding the model to be of benefit. Um, so some organizations here were saying they thought it's an overall framework for aligning our strategic and improvement initiatives. Thailand, this organization is saying it was great for them because they could benchmark the performance against world-class standards and obtain independent feedback. Um, Singapore had a great example, I think it was from Kenwood Electronics, saying they used it to improve the whole supply chain. So they got the, the, all of their suppliers using the business excellence framework, undertaking assessments. So if their supply chain improves, their own organization's performance improves. Another SME used business excellence like as a governance tool. Because as an SME, my organization, I have BPR.com Limited, it's an organization just, just of 10 employees. So we use a framework like it's a governance tool. We can't afford independent directors. So business excellence assessment just is, a, is a check to see whether we're heading in the right direction and doing things in a sensible, professional, and ethical manner. Uh, another organization, Infosys in India, they grew from 7,000 employees to 120,000 employees in a period of nine years. To manage that growth and to make sure their cultural values did not change, they used the business excellence framework. So you can use it for different purposes to help you to improve. But it helps, you can assess all your different uh, individual sites, manufacturing sites or production sites, using the framework and find out where they are on a journey, share their best practices, and go on this, say, go on this journey together. Okay, the final finding. We're gonna finish in five minutes, okay? The final finding was that we heard throughout all these different countries, all the organizations were saying benchmarking is absolutely essential. But they also wanted more assistance in terms of how to do benchmarking and getting access to these best practices. So this is sort of some of the feedback uh, we got from the various countries. And I think you'll find a similar case in Malaysia. You want easy access to best practices. This is why MPC plays a very critical role to encourage organizations to use their bond website, to encourage organizations to attend their best practice sharing events. I think we need to do more in this area. OK, so what are the conclusions? Uh, the impact is that uh, because of the impact of, this, of the study and showing that business access is indeed relevant, it's really helping organizations improve, it validated the need for a center of excellence for business access within Asia, and that has now been set up. And you can actually go to this link here and find out some of the activities that this center is conducting. The center is, 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 is currently based in, in Singapore, but all the information can be obtained uh, from the website. It's got lots of nice documents you can have access to. Okay, before I finish this presentation, um, I, I'm going to leave you with six key questions that you need to answer. Number one is, does your organization assess its strengths and weaknesses against business excellence criteria? And if so, do you develop a plan of action as a result of that? And do you do it every year? Because if not, you should be thinking about doing that. Okay, number two, does your organization live by the core values and concepts of excellence? Do you really strive to embed those inside your organization? Do you understand them? Number three, does your organization encourage and help your customers and suppliers to follow a business excellence path? 
Do you get them to do business excellence assessments? Do you educate them on business excellence? Surely you want the whole supply chain to improve. If the whole supply chain is successful, your business is more likely to be successful. Number four, does your organization continuously review what business improvement tools it uses to improve performance across all functions and processes? Therefore, which of these tools does your organization use? Are there any gaps? Is it duplication? There might be a time to refresh or have a look again at what tools and techniques you use. Benchmarking is the most popular improvement tool in the world. Is your organization using it? But more importantly, do you understand it? Do you know the difference between informal and formal benchmarking? If you use benchmarking, have your people been trained? I'm sure if your organization uses a balanced scorecard or uses Six Sigma or uses Lean, your people have been trained. I doubt very much whether your people have been trained in benchmarking. So how do you expect to get the benefits from benchmarking without your people being adequate, adequately trained? Number six, business excellence models guide organizations towards long-term sustainability and competitiveness. So the key question is, are you and your leaders 100% committed to follow this path? Thank you very much indeed. I think we can have a break now. Thank you.